the new covenant and the kingdom. This is week five of this. We've been talking about the new covenant and the kingdom since Ash Wednesday. And I have to tell you, it's been a life transforming thing for me personally, as I've really grappled with this and realized how much of the old covenant Christians believe. So many Christians live in an old covenant reality. And it's very sad because of all that's available to us. And I think that God's really doing a new reformation. And we're going to take where the reformers left off and go into, a, I think that Bill, that Bill Johnson just barely touched the threshold of where God was going, is going. And he set the stage. But not only is God good, but that we, we have a new identity. We have a new calling that's so transforming, so freeing, so empowering, that if more people get this, the world is going to be turned upside down again. So let's recap some of the things we've talked about over the last five weeks. The new covenant is present future. It doesn't look back. The new covenant never looks back. All the other covenants are fulfilled and point to the new covenant. Nancy and I have talked a lot about this because uh, uh, over the years, because we're from the land of the covenant makers. Every town in New England was founded on a covenant. I'm actually in a state that was founded on a covenant with God. And there's, there's a good aspect to that, but the problem and why those covenants failed was that they established old covenant covenants with God here in New England that were based on performance. And when they broke those covenants, it released a curse on the land. And that's what we're, what's going on. Our whole country is suffering from it because of it. So they weren't tapped into the new covenant reality. So that all the old covenants point to the new covenant. Second, the new covenant is inside out. God works from the inside out, not the outside in. It's about the transformation of the interior life first. Third, the new covenant is relational. It's all about relationship. As, as I said a few weeks ago, when Jesus talks about being, uh, worshiping in spirit and in truth, God is spirit. And in order for us to be able to relate to him, we have to become spirit. And so because of that, we become a new creation. We become something completely different because the Holy Spirit comes and fills us. And then we can relate to God because God is the most relational being in the universe. The new covenant is Jesus living in you through the Holy Spirit. Not anything you do, not any obligations, not any performance, not any task. You are in the new covenant because Jesus lives in you. And this is the, the, this is the reality. The new covenant is about identity, not performance. An interesting reading in the Gospels this week was Jesus said, that I can receive no glory from man. That turns a lot of theology on its head. The only way you, we, God can receive glory is through him living in us. How's that? Back to the spirit and the truth. God can receive no glory from man. No, no, nothing you do will give God glory. Only you being in the new covenant. There you go. That'll really mess. There's, Forget performance right there. It's over. And then this one is so important. The, king, this, the new covenant is about the kingdom, not a religion. Jesus never came to start a religion. And so two-thirds of the things you're concerned about with different Christians are about religion, not the kingdom. And when you take religion off the table, suddenly everything's different. And of course, Jesus said 
that the new covenant is the Eucharist. This is the covenant in my blood. And he takes bread and wine, and we celebrate this every week. We're right back to cross, water, door. Like I said at the very beginning, it's everything. So in our gospel lesson, Jesus tells us something today that is the core spiritual law of the universe. You cannot have life without death. You cannot do the new covenant without death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. You can't become something in your own. You can't, you know, when I worked for Trader Joe's, we had this thing that we said every day at work, Kaizen. And I write about this in my books because it's a very good concept, which is you can do little things to improve yourself every day. Do one little choice, make one little choice every day to change your life. Not a big thing, don't change everything. Just one little choice every day, do a little thing. And eventually you'll make big changes. Well, that isn't the new covenant. That's actually the world, the flesh and the devil, to be totally honest. Because the new covenant says you have to die. And when a seed goes into the ground, it dies. And when it comes out of the ground, it bears much fruit. And most of the stuff you see in ministry and Christians, that the, these cycles that Christians go through, someone you know, asked me to be their spiritual director because they wanted to break the cycle of sin management in their life. That was the, their words, not mine. And I said, well, you can't do little things to change. If you want to do this, you have to die. And I'm going to show you how. And he said, okay. The center of the new covenant is this. If anyone wants to follow Jesus, they must do like Jesus does. He says this, die. This is John's version of what it says in Mark chapter 8. Take up your cross and follow me. You know, this, I've thought so much about, actually, I've been praying for Betty White, you know, who's all over the place lately, it seems. And, you know, and I think of the scripture, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world? She's gained the whole world. She doesn't believe in God. She's an atheist. And the thing is, the day she dies, some evangelical newspaper will put out a thing. Well, she went forward at a Billy Graham crusade once. Well, well, big deal. She didn't take up her cross. She didn't die. That evangelical understanding of salvation is inadequate. It's not the new covenant. That's a religious thing. You had a religious conversion, but you're not in the kingdom. Jesus said, come and die with me. And if you die with me, I will give you my life, my resurrection life, and I will bring life in your body. And you'll see the dead raised, and you'll see eyes open, and you'll see ears open, and you'll see the lame walk, and you'll see God miraculously provide for you. But it costs everything. If you die, you will be resurrected, and you will get a better life here, and a great life and reward in the hereafter. but you can't get there without dying. And dying before the day of your death. This is why this doesn't get preached very much. It's, uh, it's where the real power is, but you can't build a big ministry in a big church this way because it's not popular. It's not popular. But it's the, it is the fundamental law of the universe. It is what the universe is built on. It says that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus is the lamb. And it's a mystery. This is why we say every Sunday, 
Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Because this is the fundamental core of the created order. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That's from Nachfolge, the uh, cost of discipleship. I've read it in both in English and German. The German's better. And I have to say, if you have never read this book, you need to read it. It's a must read book. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And you know, Bonhoeffer did. Bonhoeffer did. He took his own advice. There are, there are various religious distortions of this, take up your cross and follow Jesus. The first, and, and they seem very noble, and they, they uh, appeal to people who have, you know, sentimental personalities often, or neuroses. And the first is, oh, we all have our crosses to bear. And what that means is that we all have things in life that suck, and we just have to bear them. And th there's this very bizarre thing. We, oh, I just have this horrible thing going on in my, my life, but I'll just offer it up to God and it will be to my credit. Well, no, that's not the Bible. It's not what Jesus said. Jesus never said, oh, you all have your crosses to bear. You all have an Aunt Myrtle who's annoying that you have to enjoy, invite to dinner, whether you like her or not. Or, you know, we all have to do rotten jobs in life that we don't like. That's No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about laying it all behind, laying it down. You can only get to resurrection and the kingdom through death. But let me tell you something. God never called you to accept less than the kingdom. There is nothing noble in mis misery. God does not get glory from you being sick, which is the Calvinist Protestant version of the same thing. That's making doctrines of disbelief. And this, it's a form of religious resignation. And it's very close to Buddhism. You know, Buddhism and religion, and practices you know that you hear about mindfulness all this do you know what this is this is about life sucks and if you do these things you'll at least feel better but it does nothing to change your life the kingdom changes things the second is is a distortion of this is kind of a maudlin fixation on death blood gloom without redemption this is why evangelicals only sing songs that have gloomy Christmas at Christmas time, because they can't just re relax and rejoice. You got to have Mary, did you know um, your baby boy is going to be put on a cross? Merry Christmas. I had one lady who wouldn't let, wouldn't, you couldn't have a manger scene without a crucifix in it because you had to remember that Jesus was going to die. So uh, Jesus is not happy. You know, I grew up in a world where we had sorrowful mother pictures, you know, Our Lady looking sad and, you know, and a reminder, and there's a, Herman and I have this inside joke. There's a church in Boston that has a statue of Jesus where his hand is over his face and you, you come and you pray and you confess your sins, but there's like, Jesus is ashamed of you. And it's like, well, that's not, that's, that's garbage. It really is. I, whenever somebody gives me a hard time, I put that picture of Jesus with his hand on his face. I, I almost put it up today, but I thought somebody might get triggered. So um, I didn't want to trigger anybody. Uh, but it's this sort of penitential thing. You know, I was looking for songs for Passover. And Passover is supposed to be joyful, and it will be joyful. But, you know, I found all these Christian songs written for Passover that were just so... Blood, 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 
blood on the doorpost, blood under our fingernails, blood on the floor. It was like, I was like, no, that's not what it's about. But you, you ask them to deny themselves and they're like, no, I'm going to an R-rated movie. Seriously, let's face it. Let's be real, okay? Let's be real. I've got to, I'm going to play Xbox for 18 hours today and forget everybody else. But blood, we'll listen to some blood songs and that'll be okay. That was free. And of course, the flip side of this is resurrection without death. And you know, there are lots of churches that aren't that have are happy clappy churches that are not going to celebrate, not going to do anything for Holy Week, not going to mention the cross, but they're going to have a blowout celebration on Easter Sunday. And and you know, and that's the, that's just that's marshmallows and donuts. It's peeps, you know, those of you outside the US don't know what a peep is. A peep is a marshmallow with a candy coating that's crunchy and they're, they're brilliant, gross colors. And if you put, they're the shapes of bunny rabbits and little chickies and you put them in the microwave and they get big. They have absolutely no food value of any kind whatsoever. Being overseas, I finally came back and I saw some in a grocery store and I, I, I used to love them and just the sight of them makes me kind of want to vomit. So uh, that is the resurrection without the cross. Jesus says, if you want to be a disciple, you remember about eight months ago, I taught on discipleship and you know the, the idea of a disciple in the ancient world was that you become a perfect mirror image of the master. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you know, I mentioned last week about this, this latest uh, uh, fad to call yourself a Jesus follower and not a Christian. A Jesus follower takes up their cross and dies. You must hate this life you must sell all that you have. You must leave your mother and father. You must leave brother and sister, houses and lands. Let the be dead bury their own dead. Take up your cross and follow me. And it's a, it's a one-time thing and it's a daily thing every day. St. Paul said, I die daily. That means I don't do what I want to do anymore. Jesus didn't come to make you happy, friends. Jesus didn't come to fulfill your destiny. Jesus didn't come for you to, be, to prosper um, with a big house and a car. But he said, you will be blessed and you will have a hundredfold in this life and much more in the life to come. They're very different things. They're very different things. It means I do what Jesus wants. It means listen to the Lord and do what he tells you. And let me tell you something, when you make this decision, you are not making a religious conversion decision. You're making the decision to be a disciple. And you get to experience resurrection, life, and power. You get to go to dinner parties and see people get delivered from post-traumatic stress without any effort. It just happened in the conversation. You don't get to do any more religious buzzes, you know, the outside in religious buzz. 
where you have to go from conference to conference or go to the right speaker or the latest song. But you do get consistent life and power flowing. Consistent, not revival, not boom and bust. Consistent. Eugene Peterson called it a long obedience in the same direction. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead works in you. And suddenly, there is a shift. And you start living a life that people see Jesus in you. So total strangers in art supply stores notice that there's something really different about you. And they come and they join your tribe. That's what happened with Rachel. So that's just what happened. It's just like something's different about this guy and this whole thing. There's something going on here. People see Jesus in you. You can't help it. People, people will confess their sins to you in the grocery store. Really. Because you are different. You are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You are something new. Let me tell you some stories. Uh, last, a year and a half ago in London, I, I had a, made friends with a pastor who was from Newport, Rhode Island. He was wearing a Boston Red Sox hat. And I said, where are you from? And he said he was from Newport. It turned out he knew exactly where he was born. And uh, we started talking and he started asking me about myself. And of course, you know, I was doing the whole ministry embarrassment thing that I do. And I said, well, you know, last year, God told me to sell all that I had and come to England. And I, I'm living out of a suitcase and I'm not sure where I'm living yet and all that. And he goes, he goes, own it. He said, you've done what Jesus said to do. Go sell all that you have and be my disciple. And you've done it. I said, oh, interesting. I'd never really thought about it. And of course, you've heard some, there have been some marvelous testimonies from that. And of course, a lot of you are the marvelous testimony. So God is really good. So I, I started thinking about this, you know, own it. I have done it. Well, my last, the last three books that I've written, you know, is really gearing up because I do get this negative, I get, you know, I've gotten a lot of hate mail over the years. Not so much recently, but a, a, some time ago, I was, there was a stretch where I had a lot of hate mail. And so I was gearing up to get, get stuff from the Gospel Coalition because I actually take on some of the stuff with Calvinism in the new books. And I thought somebody's going to re read this and come after me. And I thought about what Thomas had said to me. And I thought, well, I know what my, um, uh, I know what my, my response will be. And that is, well, Jesus said, go sell all that you have and be my disciple. Leave father and, father and mother, houses and lands. And he said, you, know, you, you have grief about what I've written. When you do that, come talk to me and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Wow, was that freeing. Talk about a death. When you do that, then I'll talk about predestination with you all you want, but you do that first. One day, I was driving back from Boston after doing these three-hour prayer sets in, at Lion of Judah in the south end of Boston on a Friday. And the commute out of Boston on a Friday is just a headache and a half. Sometimes it was three hours of bumper to bumper crawling traffic. I lived an hour away from Boston, 40 miles. It took three hours to go 40 miles. And one night I got as far 
It's Nashua, New Hampshire. And all I was thinking about, I knew that dinner was ready for me when I got home. I got a text saying dinner was ready. I was like, all I could, I couldn't wait to get home and eat dinner. And I'm driving down the road and the Lord says, I want you to go to Panera Bread and eat dinner at Panera Bread. And I said, I want to go home. And the Lord said, no, you really need to go to Panera Bread. I said, really, Lord? Really? And the Lord said, do you trust me? The weighted question I get quite often from the Lord, do you trust me? Yes, I trust you. Playing dirty today, I guess. Yes, I trust you. I will eat at Panera Bread. And of course, Nancy knows this. I had no money. It was like two shekels to rub together. So it's like going out to Panera Bread, which is like a chain in the US. Uh, was not, I don't want to spend money if I don't have to. So I uh, pull into Panera Bread. I order my dinner, eating my sandwich and soup. And, um, and I notice like I, I'm sitting, there's no one in the restaurant except for two older men and about a 20 something year old guy. 30, about 30 years old. And they're having a, a conversation. And it's clear that the young man is married to another man. And these two young and these two older men are having like a conversation about faith and stuff. And they say to the young man, you know, all you need is just a little more discipline in your life. And I put down my fork and I stood up and I walked over to their table and I said, and I lied and I said, I'm sorry, I don't normally listen in on other people's conversations, but I couldn't help overhearing your conversation. And I think I have something to say. And they looked at me and the two men looked so relieved. And I told them my story. And then I got the backstory. So this young man who we will call Fred had been in a, had never been to church before in his whole life, had had no Christ, exposure to Christianity of any form. And uh, he worked in a cubicle, shared a cubicle with another guy in an office. And Fred was a very unhappy guy. And he was married to another man. He'd been, they'd been married for seven years. And Fred came to work every day, kind of depressed and sad. And his roommate in the cubicle was a very happy guy, just generally happy. Nothing, nothing exciting about the guy. But Fred knew that the guy was a Christian. He had a Bible verse taped to his wall in his, in his cubicle. The guy in the cubicle never once said a word to him about Christianity. But Fred figured out that his cubicle mate was happy and he wasn't happy. So one Sunday morning, he decided he was going to go to church. And he opened up his phone book and found one of these churches with the benign Christian name like Sojourner Church or something, whatever, some kind of church like that. Seeker Church, we call them a seeker church. And I, I was just amazed as he was telling me this story because I'm so jaded, you know, and he was so innocent. And so he went to the Sojourner Church or where, whatever it was. And the pastor kind of gave some message and then at the end said if there's anyone here who has any questions 
about what I said today, please come forward. Well, Fred went right forward and he said, yeah, I have a lot of questions. And they gave him a Bible and he read the Bible and he decided that he was going to be a Christian. And so he went to the church and he said, if I want to be a Christian, I have to be baptized. So will you baptize me? And these two men were the elders from the church and they were sitting down with him that night to sort out what are they going to do with a man who's married to another man? Should they baptize him or not? And I walked in on their conversation. And I told the, um, the two men from the church, here, let me take over. I looked at Fred and I said, I know that you take seriously what you read in the Bible, but you only read half of what it says. It says, repent and be baptized. And you have no fruit of repentance in your life. There's no change. And, and you've, you're married to another person. You've made big life decisions. You have a house. Your families are intermingled. And I said, if you really want to follow Jesus, you need to make a decision because there's only one love when you follow Jesus. You can love your husband or you can love Jesus. You can't love both. And I told him, I said, if you really want to follow Jesus, if you really want to be a Christian, then you need to sort this out before you get baptized because if you ask these good people who love you, to baptize you, two things are either are going to happen. First, you're going to split their church. Do you want to hurt these people and split their church? And he looked at me and he said, no. And so the second is, you're going to open up the door to all kinds of struggle in your life, and you're going to live a hypocritical life. And you're going to be, unha you're going to be more unhappy than you were before. Do you want to do that? You can't have both. And then I said, you think about this. This is a big decision. You don't take this lightly. If you want to break up with your husband and follow Jesus, you do that. But you, you know what you're doing before you do it. And I said, and if you make that decision, then you've shown the fruit of repentance and you're ready to be baptized. I went back and finished my soup. The two guys from the church looked so relieved. Oh my goodness. And I went home. I gave him my phone number. The next day I get a phone call. I've left my husband. I'm getting baptized next Sunday. He went on to the mission field. He left that church actually, because he was really serious about Jesus and it only took him so far. He found a really good church. He went overseas. On the, overseas, he met a woman. They have kids now. They're married. When Christ calls a man, he calls him come and die. We're headed into Passover, the Passover of the Lord. This isn't a religious celebration. This is a renewing of all things. This is a restoring and announcing the new covenant to the world and to ourselves. It's about building a spiritual stronghold. You know, we talk about strongholds in a negative sense all the time, but you know, we're called to build positive strongholds. 
You know, every time we celebrate the Eucharist together, we're building a stronghold in the spirit. When we, when we mark the Passover, this death into life with Jesus, we're building a stronghold in our own lives and in the world around us. That's why there's a war over these things. These holidays aren't a joke. If they were a joke, there wouldn't be the war over them. Jesus took bread and he broke it and said, you be like me, be broken bread, poured out wine. This is the new covenant. And when we do this, we proclaim his death. We participate, we experience, we live the Lord's death until he comes. And if we do this, we receive his life within us. This is what it means when it says, abide in me. It's not a mental exercise. Abide in me. Come follow me. Come die with me. Get under the water. Get buried. But, but not just the water. Your life is a death. And then when you come up out of that water, you abide in me when you eat this bread and you drink this cup. And when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you live in me and I live in you. And you have my life within you. It's not mental agreement or spiritual practice, it's reality. It really is. This is the kingdom. Unless a grain of wheat dies, there will be no fruit. If you want fruit, this is how you get it. If you want real fruit, fruit that will last, fruit that multiplies, this is how you get it. And if you lift Jesus up this way, if he's lifted up in your life this way, all men, he will draw all men to you. Everyone will be drawn to you. Because everybody's looking for a king like Jesus, right back where we started. Everybody's looking for a king like Jesus. When I was a student, we had a speaker in chapel who said, God is calling you to have a contract with him. You take a white sheet of paper out of your desk. You go home. You sign it. You date it. And that's your, that's your contract with Jesus. And he fills in the rest. I have a piece of paper with, this, with my signature and date. It's in storage, but I still have it from 30 some odd years ago now. You know, I'm not teaching anything today I don't live. Uh, it's a day by day. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have struggles. But, God will do things in your life that exceed all your expectations and imaginations. <laughs>